Hogwarts. Big Boss in the Harry Potter World. Chapter 21. In the eyes of most ordinary wizards in the magic world, those who can skillfully use black magic are dark wizards. But what is black magic? In the relevant documents and regulations of the Ministry of Magic, black magic is defined as follows, magic that causes irreparable and huge damage to the body or soul of the caster and the caster. Such magic is collectively known as black magic. In the eyes of ordinary wizards, magic that causes great damage and targets the soul is black magic. The three unforgivable curses are typical black magic. The fierce fire curse, corruption curse, and other spells that can cause irreparable damage to others are all classified as black magic by the Ministry of Magic. Solemn knew when Schuyler was in school that black magic is not as simple as explained by the Ministry of Magic. As long as it is powerful magic, it is black magic. This is a wrong concept. If you want to understand what is black magic and what is white magic, you must have a deep understanding of a problem what is magic. What is magic? Is it the colorful rays shot from the little stick in the wizard's hand? This is the case in the eyes of most wizards, because they don't know how to study magic, they are just users, and most wizards are not qualified users. Schuyler gave Solemn the standard answer. Magic is emotion, magic is the will of the wizard. Very idealistic, isn't it? Let me give you an example. The magic riots of the little wizards all broke out when they were emotionally unstable. For example, Neville was thrown from upstairs, Harry was pushed by Dudley to the glass that disappeared, and Solemn was extremely eager to learn magic. The magic riot makes the magic power of the little wizards into a dominant existence, allowing them to consciously manipulate some things, floating cups, still water drops and so on. And what steps are needed for a real magic to be unleashed? The first is to condense the magic power, then inject the will, and finally release it through the wand. So what are black magic and white magic? Or to give another example, the Patronus charm, an extremely standard white magic, white magic in every sense. To release this magic, the wizard needs to inject his own joy and happiness, and at a higher level, he needs to inject the firm will of guardianship. The killing curse, an absolute black magic, requires the caster's desire to kill, which is why the killing curse has become one of the three unforgivable curses. Wizards who often use the killing curse will gradually lose themselves, always in the people who are eager to kill or not normal people no matter what. Human emotions can be divided into positive emotions and negative emotions. Like joy, joy, happiness, peace, happiness, etc., these are positive emotions. Negative emotions like disgust, hatred, fear, jealousy, greed, despair, etc. Wizards use these emotions to unleash certain spells that require them. This is the so-called white magic and black magic. Magic like disarming spell and cleansing spell, what kind of emotions do you want, this is a relatively neutral magic. There are many such spells in the Ministry of Magic's list of dark arts. For example, the fierce fire curse, this magic does not involve emotions, but the power of this magic is a bit strong, and it is not easy to control, and it is easy to cause a lot of people and property losses. Another example is the corruption curse, which can cause extremely serious damage to the human body. When hitting an important part of the human body, such as the head and upper body, if it is not properly dealt with in a very short time, it is very likely to be fatal. In the eyes of most wizards, such powerful magic as fierce fire and corruption are all black magic. How? Are you less resistant to black magic? Solemn said to the three who were still digesting the information. Is this black magic? Hermione asked Solemn in disbelief, the definitions of black magic in the books she had read were all evil, depraved, and unforgivable magic. But in Solim's mouth, Black magic is completely different from those in these books, which makes Hermione, who has always believed in books, at a loss for a while. Black magic is not necessarily evil, but evil must be black magic. Solemn believes that it is necessary to be vigilant against black magic. It's best not to use magic like the killing curse, the Crucitus curse, and some magic that will have some subtle effects on the caster. Solemn warned the three, especially Draco, and some pure-blooded children, dark magic was to them what chicken legs were to Ronald. Even the fierce fire curse and the corruption curse are not black magic. Hermione couldn't believe it. Many books on magic she had read would mention black magic, and when it came to black magic, except for the unforgivable curse, it was all black magic. 
The fire and corruption spells appear the most. In Solemn, these two magics that most wizards consider to be black magic are not black magic. Seeing that Hermione couldn't turn the corner for a while, Solemn smacked his lips. Once the cognition is formed, it is difficult to correct it. This is also human nature. Okay, let me give you an example. Solemn took out his wand with his left hand and pointed at Neville, stunned. Neville spread out on the chair without any suspense, and then slid off the chair. My god, what are you doing? Hermione was taken aback. Resuscitate quickly. Neville lay on the ground and still didn't understand what happened. Stunning charm, Hermione, do you think the stunning charm is dark arts? Solemn went over and helped Neville into a chair and sat him down. Seeing that Neville was fine, Hermione looked at Solemn again, and then shook her head. She didn't think the stunning charm was black magic, after all, this magic was so popular that many students would use it. Then you have to sit still. Solemn sat down in his seat again. According to the Ministry of Magic's definition of black magic, the stunning spell is a black magic. Now it wasn't just Hermione, even Neville who had just recovered and Draco on the side stared at Solemn incredulously. Don't look at me like that. Solemn waved his hand with helplessness on his face. According to the regulations of the Ministry of Magic, all magic aimed at the soul belongs to the category of black magic, not only the stun spell, but also the legilimency spell, the joy spell, the calming spell, the forgetting spell, etc. all belong to black magic. 4. The soul. The three little wizards looked at each other. Stunning spell, for the soul. Solemn watched the three people's reactions with amused, and began to explain. Inducing a coma in a person can be achieved by a number of means. If you take a brick, you will be dizzy. If you starve him for three days without eating, he will be dizzy if you are hungry. If you have the ability, you can also be dizzy if you are angry. Even some muggle chemicals can do this. But these are all physical, while magic is much simpler, just targeting the soul of the target. A weakened, simplified soul shock can achieve the goal. The human soul is like water contained in a cup, which should be calm normally, and all kinds of magic for the soul are trying to make the water in the cup no longer calm. Something like the killing curse simply pours the water out. Some curses against the soul are to boil water, and slowly the water in the cup will be boiled dry. And the stunning spell is nothing more than shaking the glass to make the water in the glass oscillate. These internal things all involve the root and origin of magic, that is, the magic pattern. This is not knowledge that you can touch now. There is an elective of runes in the third grade. If you are interested, just choose it at that time. Solemn yawned. After finishing the basic popularization of black magic, Hermione was still not satisfied. And what about dark wizards? The books say that those who use black magic are dark wizards. Hermione's thirst for knowledge had always been appreciated by Solemn. It doesn't mean that those who use black magic are dark wizards, and those who don't use black magic are not black wizards. Do you think Dumbledore knows black magic? A great wizard doesn't know black magic, what are you kidding? If you want to reach the level of a great wizard, exposure to black magic is inevitable. If you don't touch, learn, and understand black magic, you can't become a great wizard. So is Dumbledore a dark wizard? Obviously not. The difference between black wizards and white wizards is not in what magic they use, but in the means of doing things. Still for example, a white wizard and a black wizard want to know something from the same person. White wizards will use legilimency or other gentle means to achieve their goals. But the black wizard is different, the simplest is the imperious curse, an imperious curse can solve everything. If the imperious curse is inconvenient to use, then veritaserum potion is also acceptable. Even if you are reluctant to use veritaserum potion, you can use the cruciatus curse after subduing the opponent. From here we can see the biggest difference between white wizards and black wizards. One is gentle with room for action, while the other is ruthless and unscrupulous. According to this standard, the aurors of the Ministry of Magic are all dark wizards, but are they bad people? Solemn continued without waiting for the three to answer, the means of doing things can't distinguish good wizards from bad wizards, and they think white wizards are good. Yes, dark wizards are bad, this is a very naive view. Solemn, did you learn all this knowledge from books? Hermione knew that there were four rows of books in Solim's big box, many of which could not be found in the market. 
About this matter, I think Neville can tell you. Solemn stood up and looked at Neville who had been silent since he came in, and raised his chin, indicating that Neville could talk to Hermione. I'll go out to solve my personal problems first, and wait for me to come back. The same goes for you, Draco, since you are determined to change, start today. Need help? Hermione asked eagerly. Solemn almost sprained his ankle when he heard that. I mean I'm going to the bathroom. Hermione blushed. When Solemn left, Draco and Hermione both looked at Neville, waiting for him to say something. Taking a deep breath and calming down, Neville said, I heard my uncle talk about Solemn. I have an uncle who teaches in that school. Hey, Longbottom, you actually have an uncle teaching in Skylar. Draco became interested when he heard it, teaching what? It's like history, and I can't see him very often. Although Neville is the only one in the Longbottom family generation, he has many uncles, but he hasn't had a child yet. Don't interrupt, let Neville continue. Hermione yelled at Draco, what's a skull? Draco curled his lips, and said angrily, Schuler is a magic school, only those who are qualified can go. Why have I never heard of it? There is no mention of such a school in the book. I know that there are three major magic schools in Europe. Durmstrang is in Country Day, Bobatins is in France, Hogwarts is in the country of Ying, where is this Skylar? And what qualifications are you talking about? Hermione babbled like a cannonball. She is like this, excited when encountering new things. I never went to school there, how would I know? It was the first time Draco saw Hermione in a state of excitement. I know, my grandma and uncle both told me. Hermione and Draco looked at Neville quickly, gesturing for him to continue. Only little wizards who have completed the magic riot before their seventh birthday are eligible, and they must be from a family like Selwyn's to send their children in. Neville swallowed, and separated himself from grandma and uncle. And what Solemn knew about Skylar was told to the two of them like beans in a bamboo tube. Compared with other schools for the entire wizarding world, Skylar is more like a military academy. It also teaches what other schools teach, and it also teaches what other schools do not teach. In terms of courses, Skylar has lessons in spells, potions, transfiguration, history, combat, defense, alchemy, and survival. Unlike Hogwarts, there is no defense against the dark arts class in Skylar. It puts dark arts and defense all under charms, combat and defense. As for the herbal class, except for a few plants that are hallucinogenic, poisonous, or have other conditions when they are burned, they will be explained in the spells, and most of them are divided into potions and alchemy classes. For the students of Skylar, the best way to encounter plants blocking the way in the wild is to burn them with a fire. If it is more troublesome, then use deem fire. They will only learn a limited number of plants that must never be burned. Fighting and defense are completely practical courses, teaching you how to fight and defend, how to kill different types of enemies, or how not to be killed by enemies. For the students of Skylar, the enemies are not only wizards, but also various other magical creatures or magical races. Vampires and werewolves are all pediatrics. The real troubles are races that have been fighting wizards since ancient times, such as elves. Skylar casts the Crucitus Curse and Imperious Curse on students over the age of seven once a month, targeting elves. Bela is a magical creature that is very popular with adult male wizards. When Bela starts to dance and sing, all the male wizards you see will fall into longing and happy feelings. You will feel that nothing is important in the world, and you will involuntarily want to please Bela and get her attention. Except for strong-willed wizards who can get rid of this influence, most male wizards are powerless against Bela. The ability of Bela comes from elves. Do you think elves can do what Bela can do? Abel. And the effect is much stronger than Bela. If an ordinary wizard is charmed by Bela, he can be awakened with a single slap. If not, then two slaps. But the elf's magic aimed at the soul cannot be awakened by slapping the palm. If you want to break the influence of the elf on the wizard's soul, you need a more powerful stimulus than slapping, the Crucitus Curse. The original intention of this magical invention was to forcibly break the influence of elves on wizard souls. But everyone knows what happens to people who have been hit by the Crucitus Curse. Rolling all over the floor is considered good, but more often it is convulsions all over the body, and it is impossible to stand up. Even if you stand up, your hands are trembling, and you can't hold your wand steadily, how can you fight the elves? 
However, resistance to the Cruciatus curse can be produced by being subjected to it many times. To put it bluntly, it means to suffer the Cruciatus curse more often, and you will get used to it next to each other. This habit means that the body can quickly return to normal state, not that the effect of Cruciatus curse will be weakened. And Skylar trains elite wizards. To put it bluntly, it is the wizard army. Wizards who are dedicated to fighting. The wizards have never given up their vigilance against the former enemy, and the rules established since ancient times have continued to this day. Moreover, the Cruciatus curse is the same as the Imperious curse. If you suffer too much, you will develop resistance. Although the process is very inhumane, it is still of great benefit to wizards. The Cruciatus curse can exercise the wizard's endurance, and the Imperious curse can actually improve the wizard's resistance to soul magic. Even the Aurors of the Ministry of Magic have special training against the Cruciatus Curse and the Imperious Curse, but their strength is far less than that of Skylar. When using the Cruciatus Curse and the Imperious Curse, one must master the measure. Too strong will cause serious damage to little wizards, even irreparable damage, while too weak will not achieve good results. Therefore, the wizards who cast these two kinds of magic on the students in Sigil are great wizards who have profound attainments in manipulating magic power. Skylar only accepts little wizards who have had a magical riot before the age of seven, which ensures the quality of the students. No matter how old you are, the nightmare begins after you turn seven. Cruciatus and Imperious curse once a month, from the age of seven until graduation. 24 unforgivable curses a year, no winter or summer holidays, only the 15-day Christmas holiday. If you make a mistake, there are extra, additional meals, in addition to the monthly must-haves, Schuler's students call the extra Cruciatus and Imperious curse, additional meals. When do you think you're going crazy? Next second. Or, already crazy. This is the daily greeting among Skylar students. Isn't it scary? Being tortured by the Cruciatus curse for a long time, it is true that you will recover faster and faster under the Cruciatus curse, but the indescribable pain brought by the Cruciatus curse will not decrease at all the first time you suffer from the Cruciatus curse it's the same feeling you get from Cruciatus for the hundredth time. The brain that is often confused by the Imperious curse, and the Cruciatus curse that cannot be avoided every month. It was such an extremely depressing atmosphere that made Schuyler's students more or less abnormal. Yes, that's it. Solemn said from the sidelines, if you see a, normal looking, student in Skylar, then you'd better stay away from him. Because he is either crazy or out of order, on the verge of madness, or the kind of guy you can't afford to mess with. When did you come back? The three shouted in unison, completely oblivious to when Solemn came back. While you were staring intently at Neville's face. Solemn changed a serious expression. Generally speaking, Skylar is a school that attaches great importance to actual combat. I can say without exaggeration that five students who are about to graduate from Skylar can kill this school. Light. Of course, it's not considered a professor. But Skylar doesn't only cultivate combat wizards, if he really doesn't have combat talent, he can also work on potions or alchemy. The quality of Schuyler's students is not at the same level as that of Hogwarts students. Whether it is the talent of the students, the consciousness of the students, or the quality of teaching, it is more than one level higher than Hogwarts. However, the teaching purposes of Skylar and Hogwarts are completely different. One is to focus on cultivating combat ability, and the other is, well, right. To tell you the truth. Solemn sighed, Sigil's teaching quality and depth are really incredible. Magic knowledge, magic theories, and magic skills that are not accessible to the outside world will be taught to you carefully. As for you it's two different things to learn or not. Solemn folded his arms and raised his head to look at the ceiling, sighed again, to be honest, if it wasn't for the Cruciatus curse and the Imperious curse, I might not have come to Hogwarts. TZ. Is. Very difficult. Draco asked. I guess I should be able to use the Cruciatus curse when I was in the third grade. Glancing at Draco, why don't you try it sometime? Forget it then. Draco swallowed. If possible, he would never want to suffer from the Cruciatus curse in his life. Okay, don't discuss that school. Solemn stood up, if nothing else. E.H. Wait, am I trying to set a flag? Bah, you're going to be involved with that school for the rest of your life. Come on, get up. I'm going to teach you some spells you can use in battle today. 
Salam hurriedly ended the conversation. In an adjoining room covered with cushions. Introduction to combat spells, I don't think there is anything more suitable than the disarming curse. Salam said facing the three of them with his wand in his left hand. Looking at the three people who took out their wands, Salam nodded, the first thing you have to do is to find your own suitable way of holding wands. For a wizard who is good at fighting, he can know the opponent's weight by seeing how the opponent is holding a staff. Most wizards only hold their wands with their entire palms. This is not noticeable in ordinary daily life, but once in a duel, the disadvantages of this way of holding a staff are fully revealed. The whole way of holding the wand makes the wrist joints very passive, and there is too little room for turning. When you point your wand at the opposite side, your wrist bends down, which is a very unnatural and uncomfortable position. In battle, when the enemy changes positions, they can only swing their arms in order to aim at the opponent. This is nothing to ordinary people, but in the eyes of wizards who are good at fighting, this is a huge flaw. If the way of holding a staff for ordinary wizards is, holding, the way of holding a staff for wizards who are good at fighting is, pinching, and, clamping. The so-called, pinching, refers to a way of holding the stick by pinching the body of the stick with the thumb, index finger, and middle finger. And, clamping, is a way of holding the stick with two fingers, the index finger and the middle finger, or the middle finger and the ring finger to clamp the body of the stick. These two ways of holding the stick free the wrist and allow the wrist to have more room for movement, which is extremely helpful for combat. After listening to Solim's explanation, the three of them looked at each other in blank dismay. They never thought that there are so many details in the way of holding a stick. If you usually observe carefully, you will find that Professor Flitwick's way of holding the staff is, pinching, while Professor McGonagall is, holding. Do you know what this means? Professor Flitwick is good at fighting. And Professor McGonagall is not. Solemn nodded. If you know something about the past of Professor Flitwick, you will know that he was once the dueling champion of the whole country. As for Professor McGonagall, I am not belittling her. An academic wizard like her, without if a battle occurs under prepared conditions, it is likely to be subdued in two or three strokes. Okay, before I teach you the disarming charm, I want to ask, do any of you have dragon heartstrings in their wands? Solemn looked at Draco and Hermione. Neville's wand as he gave it to me, so naturally I don't need to ask. I know this question is a bit rash, but you must ask clearly before practicing the disarming spell. Quote. Ah, uh, my wand has a dragon's heartstring. Hermione asked puzzled, what does that have to do with the core of the wand? Different woods and cores give wands different qualities. The dragon stick is biased towards black magic. When using magic with positive emotions, the dragon stick will weaken the power of the magic, and the dragon stick is easy to change. Maybe a failed duel will change the loyalty, or a failed spellcasting will also weaken the loyalty to the master, and gradually it will no longer be suitable for the person who holds it. Solemn walked over to take Hermione's wand and looked at it carefully, vine wood. Then there should be no problem, it's an interesting combination. Solemn, do you still know about wands? Draco asked in surprise. In his opinion, Solemn already knew a lot, but Draco didn't expect Solemn to dabble in the mysterious wand science. So so, I know a bit more than you guys. Solemn returned the wand to Hermione. Grapevine is also called ivy. The wand made of this wood is extremely loyal and unwavering to the owner, but considering that its core is a dragon core that is not so loyal to the owner, so I say yes interesting combination. It can be seen that you are a contradictory person, Hermione. Okay, since there are no problems, I'll start teaching you the disarming curse. Solemn hooked his hands, motioning the three of them to come closer. The disarming spell belongs to the kind of spell that is so simplified that it can't be simplified anymore, and it's so simple that it can't be any simpler. I guess you'll be able to release it after two or three tries. The spell is, abolish your weapon. It's very simple. Come and try it all. In early October, Snape made the potion. With the help of Mr. Filch, a volunteer, various potion data were collected by Solomon and Snape and became the basis for Snape to improve the potion. On Halloween, Snape gave Solemn the third improved activator. In order to confirm the effect as soon as possible, Solemn resolutely skipped the herbal medicine class and flying class in the afternoon after the first transformation class. By the way, Solemn hasn't taken a flight lesson since the beginning of school, 
Anyway, there are no exams in flight lessons. However, Harry made his mark in the flight class afterwards and was valued by Professor McGonagall and recommended to Wood. About two corridors from the Slytherin common room is a hidden room where Solemn often practices potions. Today, it is used as a temporary laboratory to observe Filch's situation. Argus, the first two times worked very well, this is the third time, and the effect will only get better. Solemn took out the bottle Snape gave him this morning, uncorked it and put it in Filch's front. Come on, you know how to do it. The mana accumulated in Filch's body was like a boulder completely blocking the entrance of the tunnel. The first time Snape made it was like black powder, the effect was not obvious. The second time was like TNT, the medicine was effective, but after drinking it, the pores of Filch's body began to ooze blood. If Snape himself hadn't been there at the time, Solemn really didn't know what to do. But the second experiment was a breakthrough, Filch could use a small portion of his magic power. This also gave Snape and Solemn another idea to solve the problem. Overly strong potions will cause harm to the human body, if the hard ones are not enough, then use soft ones. Solemn is very optimistic about the medicine this time. In his opinion, even if the effect this time is not as good as the second time, even if the progress is slower, it is better to be safe. Filch was bored when he picked it up without saying a word. Although the accident in the second experiment had a certain impact on his own body, he was able to use magic power in exchange. In Filch's eyes, as long as he can use magic, as long as it can make him out of being a squib and become a wizard, he is willing to pay any price. You're not afraid of accidents this time. After several experiments, Solomon and Filch are already familiar with each other, and they can even make some small jokes. You're not a squib, you won't understand my mood. Filch sat on the chair well behaved, and he understood the various rules after several experiments. Raising an eyebrow, Solemn didn't speak. Indeed, he was no squib. But if it wasn't for the squib, wouldn't it be impossible to understand Filch's current mood? Solemn is noncommittal. After that, neither of them spoke again. Solemn wrote and drew in his small notebook, while Filch closed his eyes and concentrated on feeling his own body. This is considered normal, after all. This is the third time, everyone knows what to do. By the time Solomon and Filch were ready to leave the room satisfied, the dinner in the auditorium was almost over. Solomon and Filch headed to the auditorium, they hadn't eaten yet. Wait, Argus, do you smell anything? Solomon grabbed Filch, this smell, a bit like troll. Turning to look at Filch, Solomon asked hastily, is there any school activity planned for Halloween tonight? As soon as the words came out, Solemn wanted to kick himself. If he is so busy these days, there will be trolls on Halloween. Things were forgotten. After all, Solemn. Well, he has no idea about Western festivals. Filch, it seems that something has really happened. Go to the auditorium to find the professor. He said there are mountain monsters in the castle. The exact number is not clear. With a wave of his hand, Solemn quickly said, Don't worry about me, it's just a mountain monster. I'm afraid that some students in the lower grades will be discovered, and that would be terrible. Hurry up. After speaking, he gave Filch and himself a bubble curse, the smell is really bad. Solemn ignored Filch, and ran to the girl's bathroom. Sure enough, a small mountain monster was attracted by the cries in the bathroom, and was bending over to go in. With a shake of his left hand, Solemn pointed his wand at the giant monster quickly, swarms of birds. A large group of birds flew out from the tip of the wand and went straight to the giant monster. The troll was attracted by the birds, and took his foot back into the bathroom. Probably annoyed by these little birds, the troll swung the mallet in his hand at random, but found that it had no effect, so the troll roared angrily. Hermione in the bathroom heard the commotion outside, and walked outside while wiping away tears, wanting to see what happened. Ah! The little girl's voice was very shrill, especially when they were screaming. Not only the troll, but even the prepared Solemn was startled by this voice. Oh my god, this can be used as a charm. Solemn still had time to complain. Hermione. Hurry in. Seeing the troll attracted by Hermione's scream, Solemn started to walk towards the washroom as he was slowly being led away from the door by the flock of birds. It's a pity that Hermione looked completely dumbfounded, she raised her neck and watched the troll walking towards her step by step, but didn't respond. 
Seeing that the troll had already raised the stick in his hand, Solom hurriedly cast an impediment spell on the frightened little girl, and without daring to stop for a moment, Solom quickly ran towards the door. It was a little hasty, he wasn't sure how far Hermione was pushed by the spell, if. Solom didn't dare to think about it. When Solom ran into the bathroom, his heart was in his crotch, Hermione tremblingly watched the troll approaching step by step in the corner, and she even forgot to use her female talent, scream. Solom hit the troll on the back of the head with a shock spell. The troll stopped, and turned to see what hit it. Hermione, hide in the compartment. Solom called to Hermione. Hermione finally came to her senses, and hid in the cubicle without saying a word. Finally, you're paying attention to me. Solom looked at the giant monster walking towards him step by step, with the tip of his stick pointed at the giant monster's eyebrows. Then you lie down honestly. The troll was too close to Hermione just now, and he was afraid that Hermione would be crushed when the troll fell down. Fian fire flickers. The upper half of the troll's face and a part of the head behind it were burnt completely in an instant. After standing there for about two seconds, the troll finally fell heavily on the floor of the washroom. After waking up, Hermione crawled behind Solemn along the gap under the compartment. She witnessed the whole scene of Solemn killing the troll. Although she was still in shock, she was awake at least. Shaking his wand, Solemn cast a cleansing spell on Hermione, who had just crawled around on the floor and made a lot of stains all over her body. After Solemn cleaned Hermione, he was about to pull her outside, although this is a women's room, I still want to ask, why are you here? Did you leave the Halloween dinner early? All in all, Solemn thinks so. Before Hermione could speak, there was a rush of footsteps in the corridor outside the door. Solemn recognized that there were only two people, and it seemed that they were not professors. When Harry and Ronald appeared at the door, they found that the women's bathroom was in a mess, a troll was lying on the ground, Solemn and Hermione stood upright, they opened their mouths to ask what happened, there was another burst of footsteps the sound echoed in the hallway, but this time it sounded like there were quite a few people. Professor McGonagall, Professor Snape, and Professor Quirrell also appeared at the door of the women's bathroom after the savior duo. Professor McGonagall scanned the messy bathroom with a livid face, Professor Snape walked up to the troll without stopping, and Quirrell slid to the ground while holding onto the door frame, twitching from time to time. Small, pretending to be like that. Solemn approved of Mr. Quirrell's acting skills in his heart. You guys. What the hell are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? Professor McGonagall simmered for a while, and of course broke out. Professor, it's me. I knew about the troll from a book, and I thought I knew it well, Hermione explained with her head down. Prove me wrong. If not. Hermione was interrupted by Solemn before she could finish her sentence. Children, naively think that the nonsense they make up can deceive adults, but they don't know that these childish lies are often seen through by adults at a glance. Come on, Hermione, who do you think you can fool with this nonsense you're making up? Solemn put his wand back away, and now that the two professors were here, Solemn saw no need to continue holding the wand. A good lie should be well crafted, not a head slapping nonsense. Tell the truth. Mr. Selwyn, did you kill this troll? Snape didn't care about the conversation of the few people, but asked his own question, although it was a question, but with an affirmative tone. Solemn nodded, I did kill it. Subduing the monster is more troublesome than killing it. And in Miss Granger's situation, I think killing it is the safest move. You know what I want to ask. Snape looked at Solemn blankly. Hey, okay okay, it's a weak and fierce fire curse. Solemn shrugged, and he didn't expect to be able to hide it from anyone. The professors in the school are all good people, and they can tell the problem at a glance. Hearing that it was the Fiendfire curse, Professor McGonagall stopped worrying about Hermione and hurried over to teach him a lesson. Mr. Selwyn, I thought you were an excellent and motivated student. Curse such a dangerous magic. Snape tilted his head slightly, waiting for Solim's explanation. As I said, it's not the Fiercefire curse. It's a simplified and weakened spell with a very short duration and a very small damage range. It won't cause any major property damage. Professor Snape, you just read this too. The magic spell is only the size of a fist. Besides, although my magic power level is good, it is impossible to release the fierce fire curse at the age of 11. 
Even if it is successfully released, it is absolutely impossible to extinguish it. Solemn called Ku. Professor, you know that the damage spell of an opponent like an adult mountain monster is not very effective. In order to control the development of the situation to the maximum extent, I can only choose to kill it. Very good, plus 20 points for Slytherin. So, Snape slowly fixed his eyes on Harry's face, can any of you tell me why you are here? We're worried about Hermione, she didn't show up for dinner, so we have two. So you didn't notify the professor, and came to find the troll yourself. Snape had a sardonic smile on his face, perhaps the famous savior thought he could handle a full-grown troll. Because of your recklessness, and Miss Granger's mistake, 30 points from Gryffindor. Snape then turned to Professor McGonagall and said, You're okay, Minerva. What could Professor McGonagall say? She thought she knew how upset Gryffindor's students were, Hermione might have something to hide, but things like Harry and Ronald were no-brainer, and she wanted to kick their asses hard. But what needs to be said still needs to be said. These two children are rushing to save their classmates, which is understandable. For their bravery and responsibility, I think they should add 10 points. How about it, Severus? Snape glanced at Professor McGonagall, said nothing, and limped away. Solemn looked at the, lame. Snape and thought for a while, he must have been bitten by a dog. Don't go to his place tonight and make things difficult for others. Now Snape is probably very depressed, and he can't speak up after being bitten by a dog, and he can't ask for compensation. If Solemn went to Snape's place tonight, Snape probably wouldn't do him any favors. You'd better go back to your respective common rooms now, and get out of trouble. Professor McGonagall glared at each of them, then tossed his robes and left. You, you. No, no, don't worry about me, I, I'll take care of it. Quirrell stood up from the ground and said stammeringly. Solemn glanced at Quirrell as he walked past him. Too bad. Come on, Hermione, today is Thursday, Neville and Draco should be waiting for us at the old place. Solemn led Hermione out, ignoring the two of Gryffindor, tell me what happened what's the matter. Show up here at dinner time. After hearing Hermione's story, Solemn sneered at her and said, so you put yourself in danger because of a jealous idiot. Remember what I told you about the dark arts. Jealousy is the real dark arts. Most commonly used emotion. Take care, Hermione. It was 11 o'clock in the morning on November 9th, and this was the first time Harry represented Gryffindor in a Quidditch match. His outstanding Quidditch talent brought him and Gryffindor their first victory of the year. Victory is a victory, but what happened on the field made several young wizards feel uneasy, that someone wanted to kill Harry. Harry and Ronald were discussing what had happened during the game before dinner. As for Hermione, today is Saturday, there is no class for a day, Hermione will not miss any time she can study, she has already taken Neville to prepare for the evening study. Because of Solim's presence, Hermione and the other two were not too close. As for Solemn, he he, do you think he's going to watch Quidditch? The little wizards in the first grade have no classes on Saturday and Sunday. These two days can be freely arranged. After the second grade, various new courses and elective courses in the third grade will fill up these two days, full. After dinner, when Hermione brought Neville and Solemn together, the first thing she said was, Solemn, you know what happened on the court today. If you mean Potter being jinxed, yes, I know, Draco told me about it at dinner just now, what? Draco kept whispering in Solim's ear during dinner while talking about it, listening to him, it's a great pity that Harry didn't fall off. I saw Snape curse Harry with my own eyes. Hermione said, looking at Solemn seriously. Interfering spells, whether casting them or breaking them, require chanting. Professor Snape should be chanting the counter curse to Potter. Of course Solemn knew the twists and turns. But we all know that between Snape and Harry. Hermione, you usually look like a smart girl, why do you think Professor Snape wants to harm Potter? From Solim's point of view, even if he didn't know the plot, he could see that there was definitely something wrong with what happened on the pitch. Professor Snape's extreme dislike and dislike for Gryffindor and Potter is acknowledged by everyone. Solemn shook his head lightly, but analyzing such things requires rationality and objectivity. Rather than relying on personal assumptions. Solemn decided to teach these little wizards how to deal with similar problems. Hermione, do you think Professor Snape is a fool? 
Solemn asked Hermione a question. Hermione shook her head. Although she didn't like Snape, Hermione had always been a good girl who was down to earth. She knew that Snape was not only not stupid, but also a very talented wizard. Having been with Solemn for so long, Hermione was arguably the student in Gryffindor who knew Snape best. Since he's not stupid, would he kill a student in front of almost the whole school? Solemn asked Hermione one after another, from your description, the distracting spell was aimed at Potter's a asterisk asterisk the broom fell, not Potter himself, well, even if he succeeded, Potter fell, and then. Did Potter just, crack, and fall to his death? Solemn looked at Neville and Draco, can you believe that a student fell off a broom and died in front of so many senior students and professors? Solemn didn't wait for them to speak, and went on and on like a machine gun. Potter will fall to his death unless none of the wizards present are carrying wands. Even without a wand, a wandless levitation spell is not difficult for Professor Flitwick, I can be sure of that. Potter will fall to his death, unless all the wizards present have forgotten how to use the levitation charm. Even if they all forgot how to use the levitation charm, no one would be killed at that height, at least not on the spot. As long as there is half a breath left, Madame Pomfrey can revive Potter. If you want Potter to die, there are a lot of opportunities, in the hallway, in the lounge, in the toilet, anywhere. But this person chose a stadium full of people. Do you think this person is stupid? And the target of this idiot's spell is not Potter, but the broom under Potter's a asterisk. Expecting Potter to fall off the broom and fall to his death is better than expecting Potter to fall to his death when he goes down the stairs. The chances are better. And this idiot is still obediently sitting on the viewing stand, staring at Potter and chanting spells, without any regard for the people around him. Come on, Hermione, tell me, do you still think that the person who killed Potter is Professor Snape? Solemn folded his arms and looked at the confused Hermione in front of him, it was rare to see Hermione like this. Solim's burst of machine guns stunned Hermione, and now she is still a little bit overwhelmed. Indeed, these problems are things that Hermione hadn't thought about before. Now that I think about it, these are very glaring, very obvious problems. But Hermione didn't notice any of them at the time. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone is trying to harm Potter, maybe it's just to interfere with his competition. You know, some senior students in Slytherin can do this. Although this method is very stupid. Solemn turned his face to look to Draco, Draco, have you heard any gossip in the courtyard? No, why don't I go back and find out? Draco also wanted to know if any senior senior in the academy had shot Harry. What if not? Hermione was a little worried, what if someone really wanted to kill Harry? If someone really wanted to kill Potter, and they chose this time period, then the person who did it didn't really want to kill Potter. Solemn stared at Hermione, but to send a message to everyone, someone in the school wants to kill Potter. Kill Potter and put the professors on alert. Then why didn't he just go tell the professors? Hermione asked. Hermione, I think you can figure this out yourself. Solemn looked at the three people in front of him, if you really want to go farther than others on the road of magic, then you must learn to use your brains. Wizards without brains don't live long. Solemn finished talking about Potter and started checking the trio's mastery of the disarming charm. Among the three, Draco's mastery of the disarming curse is the best, and Neville is of course the worst. Although he did release it, in Solim's opinion, such a slow release speed is not as good as going up and using it. Fist. It's too slow, Solemn shook his head. You all cast the disarming charm too slowly, but since you're all new to combat spells, it's understandable. The battle rhythm between wizards is very fast, and the key to victory in many cases is the speed of spell release. The only way to increase the speed of casting spells is to practice, practice non-stop, and practice it into instinct. Other than that, there is no other shortcut. In order not to be bullied, Solemn used to hold a wand when he was sleeping, practice swinging his wand when he was walking, and even practice when he was squatting in the pit. Solemn firmly believes in one thing, when the opponent is still drawing his wand, your spell has already stuck to someone's face, and it doesn't matter what spell you cast at this time. As long as you're fast enough, your opponent won't even have a chance to draw your wand. In Solim's view, a one-on-one -on -one duel between wizards is like a duel between cowboys in the American West, the point is a quick word. 
Because the wizard's body is too fragile, a stun spell can lay you down. Even a wizard as powerful as Dumbledore, who was hit by a powerful stun spell, would have almost fainted even if he didn't lie down on the spot. And a stunning spell is a tickle for most magical creatures. It can be said that most of the magic invented and improved by wizards is used to deal with the same kind. The disarming curse is the foundation of practical magic and the entry point. If you can't even master this magic, there is no need to waste your time with me. Solim's words are a bit heavy, but it is true. What could be expected of him with a useless wizard? My request to you is very simple. Less than one second in silent spells. It would be great if you can cast spells without a weapon. All three were speechless. Draco, come here, use whatever magic you want on me. Solemn raised his chin at Neville, Neville, stand aside. Draco and Solemn stood facing each other, took a deep breath, and Draco raised his wand quickly. After that, Draco couldn't use any spells, because his wand was no longer in his hand. Solemn just made a gesture of reaching out for money, and Draco's wand flew into his hand. No wand, no sound, within a second. Solemn threw the wand to Draco, if this is actual combat, Draco, you're already lying down. Want to know the consequences of losing your wand in battle. Solemn turned and slid his wizard robes down to his waist, exposing his back. There was a large scar on Solim's left shoulder blade all the way to his waist. It was pitch black, like a piece of wood scorched by fire, and the outline of his ribs clearly emerged on this large scar. The large and small depressions looked like a battlefield that had just been baptized by artillery, densely distributed among the dark scars, and a circle that looked like melted wax separated the scars from the normal skin. Solemn fastened his robes again, turned to look at the three inside, remember my lesson, hold your wands tight. Draco swallowed, his lips parted tremblingly, then, what is that? Draco felt that he was going to have a nightmare tonight. The scars on Solim's body just now were horrors he had never seen before. Solemn looked at Neville. Did Rubius tell you about this? He Rubius was Neville's uncle who taught in Skull. Neville looked down at Solemn and nodded, without saying a word. Neville had always been afraid of his cousin Solemn, mostly because of what Rubius had said to him. Most wizards who knew what Solemn had done would call him, Little Monster, or, Little Lunatic, by coincidence, and this name was spread in Sculler when Solemn was ten years old. Then keep my lesson firmly in mind. Solemn clapped his hands to attract the attention of the three. Practice well, there are no shortcuts, no boring swings again and again, no irrigation of time and energy, do you think I can reach this level at this age? Hermione finally let go of her hands covering her mouth. Like Draco, she had never seen such a horrible scar. As long as we keep practicing, can we really reach this level? Even casting spells without a battle. Although Hermione has seen Solim's spellcasting without a battle, Hermione still thinks that using such a technique in battle is still a thing difficult things. Hermione hesitated for a moment, but still asked, Also, if it's convenient, can you tell us? Hermione gestured to her back. Is that the scar? There's nothing you can't say. Solemn looked calmly at the three people in front of him one by one, you hit more with less, and the wand was confiscated. They couldn't kill me due to certain rules, so they left me an unforgettable. Solemn turned his body sideways, Mark. Can't scars be removed? Hermione asked, it says that by Xion can remove scars, street. Mungo. There is no way to repair the scars caused by the corrosive charm, Solemn interrupted Hermione. At least not yet. Okay, stop discussing this, you should focus on improving yourself now, not discussing my scars. I've already told you everything about the disarming curse, and it's up to you how much you can practice. Hermione, look at Neville and don't tell him to be lazy, Solemn looked at Draco again, Draco I don't think I need to urge you, you know what to do. Solemn sat down and looked at his magic notes while paying attention to the three people who practiced the disarming curse with each other. There was nothing Solemn could teach them about the disarming curse. The seriousness of spell practice is no less than that of the little wizards of Skylar. They are still young, they still have a lot of time, and Solemn is very interested in how far they can grow under his intervention. The Gryffindor common room was always buzzing. Groups of three or five chat loudly and brag, sit in a circle and play crackling and exploding cards, and those who play wizard chess. 
The only time to be quiet in Gryffindor's common room is to sleep with Gryffindor's Quidditch match and during vacations. When Hermione and Neville entered the common room through the fat lady's guarded doorway, they were not surprised that what they saw was the norm in the Gryffindor lounge, although Hermione still sometimes complained that the Gryffindor students were too noisy. Hermione took Neville to the corner of the lounge and sat down, and she couldn't wait to speak. Hermione still couldn't forget the horrible scar on Solim's back. She wanted to know more, but it was obvious that Solemn didn't want to say more. She could only hope that what would Vale know, after all Neville had an uncle who had taught Solemn. Neville, tell me, what else do you know about the scar on your cousin's back? Neville has been with Solemn for almost half a semester, and there are no major changes. The minor change is that he speaks more fluently, at least he will not stutter. Hermione, I actually don't know much. I only know that Solemn was bullied miserably when he first entered that school. Neville scratched his head, it's just like me before, but now that he's here, nobody bullies me, and Malfoy talks to me now. I really appreciate my cousin. Hurry up and get to the point. Hermione saw that Neville was about to reminisce, and interrupted him hastily. Neville tilted his head and thought for a while, it should be when I was 10 years old. If I remember correctly. When you were 10 years old. Hermione thought to herself, who knows what you're talking about when you're blabbering. The injury on my cousin should have been when he was 10 years old. Neville looked at Hermione and said seriously, my uncle seems to have told me that every time he mentioned his cousin, he would call him a, little monster, come on. Or, little crazy. I'm warning you. Hurry up and get to the point. Hermione was furious, and you ended up saying what I asked, why do you keep getting things wrong? Um, oh, okay. Neville shrank his neck, I don't know exactly how my cousin got hurt, maybe my uncle told me, maybe I forgot. But I know what happened later. Hermione signaled Neville to hurry up and talk, don't dawdle. Cousin gave someone, black gloves, Hermione, do you know about black gloves? Neville asked. Black gloves. I know about white glove duels. What are black gloves? Hermione knew from books that white glove duels were once popular among wizards. However, the Ministry of Magic promulgated the Duel Prohibition Act, and wizards became more fond of duels. Slow down. Conflicts between wizards used to be resolved through duels. When a wizard initiates a duel with another wizard, there is a process. First, a white glove is thrown at the other party, and the other party usually accepts it. Then, it is filed in the Presbyterian Council or the Ministry of Magic in writing. The wizarding organization usually persuades both parties. Giving up the duel is just a formality. When it is determined that the problem must be resolved through a duel, the initiator of the duel will specify the time, while the recipient of the duel will specify the location. When the duel day comes, both parties will each bring a duel assistant. First, the two parties duel. When one party is about to lose, they can seize the opportunity to throw a white glove, which means admitting defeat. At this time, the other party cannot do harm. Of course, if you don't wear white gloves, or have no chance to throw white gloves at all, then you die. Next, the loser will decide whether the dueling assistant should play a second match. If they want to fight, the winning side will decide whether the party will continue to fight or send an assistant. After the duel, look at the result. If the loser loses again, they must be prepared to pay the price. Maybe it's galleon, maybe it's something else. But if it is to be won, it is a tie, and there shall be no more duels between the two parties. Then the duel process and results will be recorded by wizarding institutions. The black gloves are different, and it is different from the white glove duel, even if you lose, you have a great chance of surviving. Black gloves mean deathmatch, no assistance, no additional alchemy items, the only thing to rely on is the wand in hand and the skills of the wizard. Black gloves are duels aimed at killing each other. The black gloves also have a similar set of procedures and rules, the age difference between the two parties must not exceed 20 years, and both parties must have a reason not to die, which prevents duels like white glove duels because of trivial matters. Hermione listened with gusto, but she wasn't worried about Solemn, after all, Solemn was living well now. Wait, Neville, Hermione seemed to realize something, Solemn. Solemn, he killed someone. Solemn is a man who has experienced black glove duels, and he is now studying at Hogwarts, so it goes without saying. 
How could Solemn survive without killing the other party? Neville nodded, yes, I was shocked when I found out. The other party seems to be a very old family, I forgot what it was called. My uncle said that the duel between cousins had a great impact, and he offended killed a lot of people. But the uncle said that the cousin did nothing wrong. Hermione suddenly realized that Solemn was fundamentally different from the other students at Hogwarts. Of course Hermione knew that Solemn was very strong, and also knew that Solim's mastery of magical knowledge and skills far surpassed that of the students in the school. But Hermione has always regarded Solemn as a little different little wizard, maybe he is very strong, maybe he has a lot of knowledge, maybe he is more mature than other little wizards of the same age, but today Hermione seems to suddenly realize that Solemn is like them people of two worlds. If Hermione is in a fairy tale world, there are wizards, magic, and flying brooms, the people around are very friendly, and there is an old man with a white beard. Solemn is in a cruel world, a real, cruel world. It was beyond Hermione's imagination that a ten-year-old had killed someone. Thinking of Solemn whom she saw almost every day, Hermione suddenly felt a little scared. Neville knew what Hermione was thinking when he saw Hermione's expression. Considering Neville's childhood and family, he was actually a very sensitive child. Hermione, don't think too much about it. Don't think too much about what. Harry and Ronald came over, they had been looking for Hermione. It's nothing, you guys came just in time, I still want to find you. Hermione adjusted her mood quickly, she just wanted to talk to Harry about what happened in the Quidditch match that afternoon. Harry and Ronald sat down and looked at each other, and finally Harry said, well. Hermione, we haven't written Professor Spencer's thesis yet, it's due on Monday, can we have a look at yours? This is not the first time the two of them asked Hermione for homework. Hermione stared at Harry and Ronald, closed her eyes and took a deep breath, I have something to tell you. About what happened to you during the game, Harry. Quote. We may have wronged Snape. Hermione looked at Harry and Ronald. What? Hermione, do you know what you're talking about? Ronald looked at Hermione incredulously, that's Snape. And you were the one who saw Snape cast a spell on Harry. Yes, but there are many doubts here. Hermione went on to repeat what Solemn had said to her. Hermione, you mean someone was trying to warn the professors that someone was mean to me by attacking me on the pitch? Harry asked. Yes, you heard me just now, if Snape really wanted you dead there's no need to do it on the field, because there's no chance. Hermione looked at Harry seriously. Hermione, do you believe what that Slytherin said? Ronald asked Hermione with his arms folded and his face pulled, then tell me, why didn't that person tell the professor directly? Instead, he attacked Harry during the match. I've thought about this issue. It's likely that more than one person in the school wants to harm Harry. Hermione glanced at the absent-minded Harry. The person who made the shot during the competition is likely to be watched, and he can't go directly to the professor. Come on, Hermione, let me just say it's the Slytherins doing it, they just don't want us to win the game, in Quidditch they do tricks a lot, they attack players in the corridors, they foul players during matches. This time they changed a new trick and interfered with Harry on the bench. But they still failed. In Ronald's view, Hermione was a little nervous, and she liked to think about everything. Besides, Hogwarts is safe with Dumbledore around. Did you forget about Halloween? Hermione retorted. If Hogwarts is really safe, how did the troll get in? Is it a little surprise for the professors? How many little wizards can stop the giant monster with a stick? Okay, stop arguing. Harry saw that the two were about to start arguing again, so he quickly smoothed things over. He had seen this scene a lot before, where Hermione and Ronald basically had to quarrel before they could speak a few words. Speaking of Snape, Hermione, did you notice that his leg was hurt? Harry hurriedly changed the subject. I don't care about that. I really wish you would spend more time using your brains before you find yourself forgetting how to use them. Hermione stood up and walked away without looking back. Harry and Ronald exchanged glances. Sighing at the same time, they didn't forget what they were here for, obviously, Hermione's homework couldn't be borrowed. Okay, Neville, have you finished Professor Spencer's thesis? Ronald looked at Neville expectantly. If Neville had written it, he and Harry wouldn't have to read the book, just read Neville's. The two of them knew that Neville and Hermione were very close, and Neville's homework Hermione was for the purpose. 
I wrote it, but I didn't bring it with me. Neville scratched his head. Hermione and Neville's homework was seldom done in the Gryffindor common room, more often it was taken to the hidden classroom they frequented. Solemn has put a lot of books there, and they don't have to go to the school library to borrow books at all. Neville's forgetfulness made him often forget his finished homework in their small classroom. Can you bring it to us, Neville? Tomorrow is the last day, Sunday, and it's due on Monday. Ronald and Harry hope to finish writing, or copying, Professor Spencer's paper by this evening. Neville was a kid who didn't know how to say no, especially when Harry and Ronald looked at him with glowing eyes. Okay, I'll go get it, you wait. Neville stood up and was about to walk towards the door of the lounge. Get out. Harry grabbed Neville, isn't your paper in the dormitory? It would be terrible if Filch found out if we went out now. Ronald interjected. Neville explained to the two that his thesis was in the small classroom and not in his dormitory. While it was lights out time for freshmen, it wasn't a problem for Gryffindors like Harry and Ronald. They'd already run out several times during lights out. Neville, you probably don't have experience of going out after lights out, do you? Harry and I will go with you, so we can take care of each other if we meet Filch. Harry nodded straight aside. When the three of them stood in the corridor and were ready to act, the portrait of the fat lady behind them opened again. I knew it. Hermione looked at the three people in front of her angrily. I knew what you were thinking about Neville from the three of you sitting there muttering, I'll tell you too. Write your own homework. Hermione turned her head looking at Neville. Neville, you come back with me, and you are not allowed to lend them your homework in the future. Maybe it's God's will, maybe it's some bad old man with a bad heart. When Hermione turned to go back, the fat lady had disappeared from her portrait. What are you going to do now? Ronald looked at Hermione proudly, just stand here and wait for the fat lady to come back. Or wait until Filch catches you first. The four Gryffindor cubs had no idea what was in store for them this evening. During breakfast the next day, Hermione hurried to the long table of Slytherins. She ignored the hostile eyes of the Slytherins and walked straight to Solemn. Solemn, I have something to tell you, we were at last night. Hermione was interrupted before she could finish her sentence. Of course it would be interrupted, a Gryffindor muggle wizard came to the hardest hit area where blood theory was rampant, and Hermione might be pointed at by her wand if someone in the professor's chair was not watching the scene at the moment. H.M.P.H. A. Brace, Solemn smiled at Zabini across the way, are you really going to say that word? Zabini was about to say something when Draco kicked him under the table. Solemn smiled at the two, then turned to look at Hermione, you haven't eaten breakfast yet, go back and eat before talking about anything else. After sending Hermione away, Solemn said to Zabini and Draco while dealing with the food in front of him, there is nothing wrong with being proud of your bloodline. But using it to hurt others. Solemn raised his eyelids and swept glancing at Zabini, this is a childish, low-level approach. Blaze, I'm looking forward to your final grades. Final grades. Zabini sneered, what does that kind of written grades mean? Although the written results are not comprehensive, they can explain a lot of things. Solemn wiped his mouth and looked at Draco, do you want to listen together? Solemn also experienced a Gryffindor welcome when he led Draco to the Gryffindor table, for the Slytherins. Nothing good to say of course, Solemn was completely immune to Gryffindor's trash talk, which seemed to him so childish, it didn't even inspire him to fight back. But Draco who followed him was different. Although Draco had indeed changed a lot under the influence of Solemn, the inherent hostility of Slytherin towards Gryffindor could not be changed in a day or two. Fortunately, Draco also knew that they were in other people's territory now, so he followed Solim's example and kept silent. Hermione, the old place. I'll bring the suitcase there later, and don't forget to bring the book. Before Hermione finished eating, Solemn took Draco and left the Gryffindor long table after a few words of explanation. Hermione did you tell him? Harry asked Hermione in a low voice. Ready to say. Why? It's none of his business. Hermione had a hard time hearing what Ronald was saying, his mouth was full of food. Even if I didn't say Neville, I would. Hermione resolutely blamed Neville. What's this? A Slytherin spy sent to Gryffindor. Ronald finally swallowed his mouth, he looked at Neville and Hermione, maybe too. I'm too lazy to argue with you, Neville, we should go. 
Hermione gave Ronald a blank look, beckoning Neville to leave. Wait Hermione, we are also involved in this matter, if there is anything, you understand. I think Harry and I should know too. It's up to you, but I want to remind you that you'd better keep your mouth shut. Hermione led Neville away without looking back. By the time Hermione and Neville arrived in the small classroom with the two followers, Solomon Draco had already arrived. Hermione had just gone back to her dormitory to pick up a book she had borrowed from Solom, and she wasted some time, since Gryffindor's lounge was on the eighth floor. Okay, let's hear it, what's so important that you came to tell me in such a hurry that you didn't even have a meal in the morning? Solom asked Hermione only after the group of people were seated. Solom, do you remember the hallway on the fourth floor that Headmaster Dumbledore mentioned at the opening dinner that students are not allowed to approach? We found a big dog with three heads there last night. Hermione briefly described what happened to the four of them last night. A big dog with three heads. You mean a three-headed dog. Solom rubbed his chin and pretended to think, then it must be tied up, otherwise you wouldn't be able to come back last night. The three-headed dog is a five-star dangerous magical creature. If they really want to confront each other head-on, if there are no hitters from the two teams, they will just deliver food. And even if there are two teams of hitters to deal with a three-headed dog, it is still unknown whether they can win. You must know that most magic has no effect on creatures whose danger level is rated as five stars. That's not the point. It's guarding something, the big dog standing over a trapdoor. Hermione's tone was agitated. So, what does this have to do with you? Solemn asked coldly. Several people were speechless. Yeah, whatever the three-headed dog is guarding, what does that have to do with a few freshmen? You are curious about what it guards, aren't you? Solemn folded his arms and glanced at several people in turn. But do you have the strength? It is right to be curious, but one must be self-aware. Know what you can touch and what you can't. Gryffindor's little lion is obviously inferior to the other three colleges in this regard. The little snakes in Slytherin are generally precocious. They may be curious about what the three-headed dog guards, but they will never put themselves in danger. The hawks of Ravenclaw, well, are probably more interested in the three-headed dog itself than what the three-headed dog guards. As for the little badgers of Hufflepuff, ah, uh, they hardly know how to swim at night. Even if they come out during the gate control time, the little badgers will only go to the kitchen next door to get food, and they will not run around in the castle at all. If you are curious about the three-headed dog, you can read the writings of Kazminder. If you are curious about the trapdoor, hee hee, write the suicide note first. Solim's words were obviously aimed at Harry and Ronald said. None of this interested Neville at all. Hermione was also a sensible person. Listen to you, how do I feel that you know something? Although Hermione could not be called a woman yet, the natural skills of a woman as a creature were well reflected in her. Glancing at Hermione, Solemn thought for a while, and said, you guys want to play this adventure game, don't you? I won't stop you, but you bear the consequences yourself. Before Solemn came to Hogwarts earlier, he also struggled with whether to get involved in Harry Potter's affairs. If you don't participate, then why go to Hogwarts, watch a play? But if you really want to participate, it will definitely bring about some unexpected changes. But now that he has come to Hogwarts, it shows that Solemn still wants to make trouble in his heart. After all, watching and participating in the story, the scenery seen by these two roads must be different. You might as well guess who is taking care of that dog. Let me tell you first, I'm not interested in this matter, I want to risk you to play by yourself. Solemn feels like an NPC, the protagonist is here to accept tasks and NPCs who learn skills. Hagrid was a question that couldn't bother Harry, and certainly not Hermione. The three of Gryffindor looked at each other excitedly. Now that you know everything, are you still in the mood to sit with me? Solemn wanted to get rid of a few people quickly, and then he could do his own thing. He still had to go find Snape later, and he would go after Snape. Find Filch. Even though it is Sunday, usually this day is the busiest day in Solemn. Hermione watched Solemn hesitate to speak, she was a little confused now, her rationality told herself not to get involved in these things, there was a great possibility of danger. But her heart is completely opposite, eager to take risks, eager to explore the unknown. Solemn, is this, right for us? 
Hermione finally got the words out, albeit coyly. Seeing Hermione's contradiction, Solemn was very happy. He has reason to be happy, a conflict between nature and reason, which is a hallmark phenomenon. Only now he didn't want to talk to Hermione. Ask your own heart. Solemn tapped his chest, let's talk about returning books and so on when you come back. I'll be here tonight. After the three of them had left, looking at Neville who stayed behind, Solemn asked, aren't you going? Neville shook his head, I'm going to practice the disarming charm today. Don't think that Neville is usually a dull guy like Solim's second brother, but he knows what he should do, and he has a clear goal. Such a person, even with a little talent, will achieve considerable achievements. The relationship is good, how about Draco? Do you want to be with Neville or not? Solemn asked, the first year wizards on Sunday usually either sleep in or make up their homework, or wander around the castle. Freshmen with clear plans are rare. Let's go with Neville, I'm fine. Draco shrugged. Raising his eyebrows, Solemn took out a few bottles of blue potions from the box he brought and handed them to the two of them, saying, This is a motivation potion, your magic power level is not enough, these potions can help you save a lot of time. Motivation potion is a potion that restores magic power. It has very few side effects on the human body. The only disadvantage is that drug resistance will develop with the number of times it is taken, and it will have no effect on wizards in the end. Encouragement potion, it's not very cheap, I remember a bottle cost nearly five galleons. Draco took the potion, looked at Solomon and asked, what about you? I have other things to do. Use these medicines well, don't save me, these medicines are useless to me. These medicines and so on were given by Solim's grandfather when he was in school, Solom drinks motivational potions like water and practice spellcasting whenever he has time, the little wizard's magic power will naturally not keep up, and it would be a waste of time to wait for the magic power to recover naturally, especially in Sigil, this place is everywhere hostile place. The energizing potion saved Solemn a lot of time. Okay, practice on your own, I'm leaving. Solemn waved his hand, see you at lunch. After leaving the door, Solemn headed straight to Snape's office in the basement. Today he had a lot of things to do. Hagrid's hut. So that's it, Hagrid, is that three-headed dog yours? Just like Hermione who knew Solemn well, the task of communicating with Hagrid was Harry's. How do you know about Lu Wei? Hagrid put down the teapot in his hand, and he was pouring tea for the three of them. Lu Wei. The three looked at each other. Well, I won it from a Grecian, and I lent it to Dumbledore to guard. Hagrid finally remembered at the critical moment that this is not something that three freshmen should know. What? Hermione asked eagerly. Enough. Don't ask. This is not what you should know. Hagrid said roughly, this is secret number one. Get it. But it bit Snape. I saw him limping that day. I don't know what else in school could hurt Snape except that dog. Harry looked into Hagrid's dark eyes unwillingly. That's impossible. Lu Wei is a good boy. Hagrid took a deep breath and slowed down his tone. Listen, you three. You're meddling in things that don't concern you, it's dangerous. Forget about the big dog, and what he's watching. It's none of your business. This is a relationship between Dumbledore and Nicholas, between. Aha. So there's a man named Nicholas involved, isn't it? Harry asked angrily. Not surprisingly, the three were driven out of the hut by Hagrid. On the way back to the castle there were three, well. It should have been two, Harry and Ronald were arguing about what Fluffy was guarding. Until the dull ones realized that Hermione hadn't said a word the whole way. Hermione, what's the matter? Nicole May. I have some images of this name, but I just don't remember where I saw it. Hermione tugged at her hair in distress. Maybe it's in a certain book you've read. Ronald reminded kindly. Are you talking nonsense? Hermione rolled her eyes and ignored Ronald. Maybe we should go to the library, there should be information about Nicholas. Harry said aside. Harry's words immediately got Ronald's support, and Hermione also said that since she couldn't remember it, it would be a good idea to go to the library to look for it. But Hermione knew a better way, that is to ask Solemn directly, Hermione dared to use her final grades to bet that Solemn would definitely know this Nicholas May. But Hermione's petite ego snuffed out the thought immediately. Okay. Hermione nodded. The three of us will look separately and hope to find it before dinner. 
At Hogwarts, most of the staff and students' understanding of the underground of the castle is lacking. Slytherin and Hufflepuff's common room, Potion's classroom, Snape's office, kitchen, and many empty classrooms. This is the underground of Hogwarts that most people know. In fact, the underground of Hogwarts is not only the Slytherin's Chamber of Secrets. The underground pipes extending in all directions connect the various rooms together, and through the pipes in the castle wall, they are connected to some rooms of the aboveground buildings, and even the common rooms of the four colleges. Every time Solemn walks in the underground corridor, he can't help thinking of these unknown secrets, and he is eager to explore these unknowns. But it's a pity that the second basement floor is the limit he can reach now, because he can't find the way. But he didn't come here today to explore these unknowns, he wanted to explore Hogwarts, he would have plenty of time in the future, he came here today to find Snape. Snape's office was even more bleak than the hallway, and darkness was the constant tone here. In contrast to the well-lit other above-ground faculty offices, the only sources of light here are the ceiling and some candles on the tables, and not all of them are lit. In such a dark and cold environment, it is not uncommon for the little wizard who came here for the first time to be scared to pee his pants. No student who had been locked up in Snape's office would want to come back again. Closing the door, Solemn followed Snape's limping a asterisk asterisk obediently to the best lit part of the office, Snape's desk. Professor, Solemn said, watching Snape sit down. If the injury on your leg is difficult to treat, you might as well ask Dumbledore for a few tears, that will be more effective than anything else. Of course, the tears of the phoenix, this is a healing treasure that even gold galleons can't buy. Snape glanced at Solemn with blank eyes, but said nothing. As for himself as a student, Snape knew he couldn't be treated as an ordinary student. During the Halloween troll event, the student used a spell that was still fresh in Snape's memory. Don't look at the hype that Solemn said at the time, what has a small scope of action and what has a short duration are all ghosts. A wizard like Snape could see through the essence of this magic at a glance. Fiendfire Blink is essentially Fiendfire, and casting methods like Solemn are more dangerous, more unpredictable, and more practical than Fiendfire in general. The release of Fiendfire Flickering does not require a lot of magic power to support it like Fiercefire Curse, nor does it need subtle magic manipulation to control like Fiercefire Curse, nor does it have various uncertainties like Fiercefire Curse. Sudden, deadly, manipulative, and the mana consumption of releasing Fiendfire is definitely much less than Fiendfire's Curse. This is a very mature mutant spell. That's what Snape thought of the Fiend Flash that Solemn had used that night. Professor, the potion is quite mature after four improvements. Solemn had already prepared a draft on the way here, what I want to ask now is, will the fully activated magic power have any bad effects on the human body, for example? Don't you have a ready-made test subject? Snape was not interested in listening to Solim's tirade, so he interrupted Solemn directly. Ah, so to speak. Solemn scratched his head, but just in case. The current experimental data are all from the same person. If you know something about potions, you should know what's in it. Snape paused, hidden dangers. What else could Solemn say? Even a muggle doctor would understand that the fact that a medicine is effective for a single patient does not mean that it is effective for all patients. But squibs are rare, let alone squibs like Filch or Silna who have not experienced magic riots for special reasons. If in the muggle medical field, a new drug is dared to be produced and sold with only one successful clinical case, something will definitely happen. It seems that I still have to contact my grandfather, so I might as well go back on vacation. Although Solemn really didn't want to go back, the way that woman looked at him. Thinking of this, Solemn got goosebumps all over his body. And for Christmas, a violent man and a big boring guy will go back, and the boring guy is okay. But Dax, the violent man, thinks that he will have a fight with his cheap brother, Solemn bites his teeth Hanako. The point is that Solemn knows that he can't beat that violent man. It seemed that it was best for me to stay under the watchful eyes of my grandfather when I got home, and not give that woman a chance to mock me or give Dax a chance to beat him. Snape looked at Solemn in front of him shivering and gnashing his teeth, and didn't ask him what he was thinking, Snape wasn't interested in these things. I've done what you asked me to do, so what about what you promised me? Snape didn't care what happened to Solemn, he agreed to this errand in the first place because of what Solemn promised him. 
As long as Solemn keeps his word, he can't be bothered with the mess. Well, anyway, Professor, you really helped me. Solemn temporarily put those bullshit things behind him, I promise you things will be fulfilled, don't worry about that, but as soon as possible it's after the festival, and I will bring you that key item when the second grade starts at the latest. Solemn thought about it, and decided to give Snape an answer first. But Professor, there are some things you have to prepare yourself. Solemn took a deep breath and looked at Snape seriously, at least. Five less healthy living people, and the stronger the soul, the better. Quote. Snape couldn't help but twitch his unchanging expression when he heard Solim's words, do you know what you're talking about, Selwyn? Solem already knew how Snape would react, so he didn't mind hearing him call himself Selwyn. This is the price. The living and the dead shouldn't interfere with each other. To achieve this taboo, you must pay a price. From under his robe, Solem took out the spellbook he had prepared earlier, the real spellbook. A completely different spellbook than the one lent to Hermione. The cover of the spellbook was a sallow, unknown material that looked greasy, and the candles and the firelight from the fireplace danced on the cover. Solemn put the book facing himself, took out his wand with his left hand, and stroked his right wrist lightly, then put his right wrist on top of the cover of the magic book, allowing the blood to slowly fill the pattern in the middle of the cover. Snape watched Solim's actions with a blank face, but was very surprised in his heart. He could see that Solemn had used a silent cutting spell when he cut his wrist, and the problem wasn't the silent casting of the spell, but the precise control of the magic that Solemn displayed. With such a close distance, the hand may be cut off accidentally, but the depth of Solim's cut is very suitable, it will neither cause a lot of bleeding because the cut is too deep, nor cause insufficient bleeding due to too shallow cut. Goog, goog. Snake was sure the eerie swallowing sound was coming from the spellbook on his desk. The blood that Solemn dripped on the cover was absorbed, and Snape saw lines of veins buried under the cover, slowly emerging with Solim's blood. Only then did Snape see clearly that the pattern on the cover was a heart. What is this? Snape couldn't help but asked anyway. Solemn gave himself a simple healing spell, but since the one he was using now was a dragon staff. The effect is somewhat unsatisfactory, after all, what dragon stick is best at is fighting. The magic book, the magic book that only Selwyn can open. After treating the wound, Solemn hurriedly opened the book, this book is consuming my blood now, wait until my blood is exhausted, if you haven't finished reading it, I will you'll have to cut your wrists again. Look here. The magic book sounds like something a wizard would touch. But in fact, only books with constant magic on them can be called magic books, not things that record magic in books are called magic books. Real magic books are all orphans, because their production is too difficult, the production cycle is too long, and the production cost is too high. Ordinary wizard families really don't have this kind of thing. The families that can produce magic books are ruthless ones with a long history and capable people. The spellbook Solemn showed Snape didn't actually have a name on the cover, but those who knew the spellbook usually called it the, Book of Blood, or, Selwyn's Book of Blood. The way to open this book is Selwyn's blood, whether it is voluntary or forced, as long as Selwyn's fresh blood is dripped on the heart of the cover painting, this book can be opened, and the time to open it will be look at the quality and quantity of blood. Solemn tried it himself, let the heart on the cover fully appear, and when the color of the heart reaches the brightest, the book can be read for half an hour. But his grandfather said that the blood of Selwyn today is much thinner than it was hundreds of years ago. It may be in Solim's generation, or in Solim's next generation, the family is likely to carry out the sublimation ceremony provided that the material ready. For a while, neither of the two people at the desk spoke. Solemn because the book brought back some memories, while Snape was shocked, maybe a little excited. Snape was of course a gifted wizard, there was no doubting that. But there were some things that a wizard of Snape's background couldn't touch. The Council of Elders firmly controls high-end magic theories, powerful magic spells, and massive resources. Ordinary wizards can only study and live in the circle drawn by the Presbyterian Church for the rest of their lives. Even if there are some talented wizards who have come into contact with some taboo and high-end knowledge by themselves, they will either be recruited by the elders, included in the organization, or suppressed. And those wizards who have the ability to break through the circle drawn by the elders meeting basically know that there is a huge monster pressing on top of their heads. 
Among these people, dragons and phoenixes naturally know what to do to benefit themselves. What Snape saw was forbidden knowledge that ordinary wizards would never have access to, the use of souls. Professor, do you have any questions about what you just saw? Solemn stepped out of his own memory and spoke first. Solemn saw Snape's eyes, which were very different from his usual closed-mindedness. Obviously, what he had just come across had a huge impact on Snape. Preferably muggle death row, professor, if it's not convenient for you. Solemn raised his eyebrows, I can do it for you. No need. Snape knew that if he agreed, then he would have to pay the corresponding price, and this student of his was not someone who would suffer. Okay, Solemn wasn't surprised that Snape would refuse, the means of collecting souls, is it necessary? How could Snape have the means to collect souls? No matter how powerful he was, no matter how talented he was, he was only living in the wizarding world planned by the elders. Such means were beyond Snape's knowledge. Snape rejected Solemn, but he didn't have the means to collect souls himself. This is a bit embarrassing. Seeing that Snape didn't speak, Solemn raised the corners of his mouth, pretending not to see Snape's embarrassment, and said, Professor, you have a way to collect souls, so what about preserving souls? Don't bring the souls that you can't use when the time comes. I'll bring the man, Snape said deadpan. This. Solemn smacked his lips, it's also a way. Bringing people directly is of course a way. You don't need to think of ways to collect souls, and you don't need to work hard to protect them after you collect them. How good it is to arrest people directly, but. But is this appropriate? At Hogwarts. Under Dumbledore's nose. Solemn didn't care, but Dumbledore's attitude had to be taken into consideration. That bad old man wouldn't allow someone to do something like that in his school, take the soul of an innocent person, and use that soul. Even if you talk about breaking the sky, such evil behavior cannot be washed away. Who said you have to be in school? Snape looked at Solemn with an idiot's eye. Yeah, why do you have to do this kind of thing in school? I'm afraid the principal doesn't know or what. Maybe the blood was a little too much just now, my T.S. Bah. I'm not clear-headed yet. Solemn rubbed his nose in embarrassment. Then get ready, I'll let you know when I get the stuff. Snape thought for a while, and asked, Your book only explained how to use souls, but why do you need souls? Although Snape was a wizard who liked, no, it should be said that he loved black magic. But he also has his own bottom line. He has wanted to ask this question for a long time. After listening to Snape's words, Solemn thought for a moment before opening his mouth and said, First of all, I want to explain that for some wizards, the soul is actually a very common spell-casting material. Of course, Professor, you know that I am definitely not talking about ordinary wizards. Let's put aside the topic of the soul, Professor, let me ask you a question first. How many ways are there to communicate between wizards, excluding face-to-face -face like we are now? Snape looked at Solemn with emotionless eyes and said nothing. He was extremely displeased with people like Solemn talking around. If it was Dumbledore, he was a big boss anyway, so what are you pretending to be like, a brat like me? Fortunately, Solemn quickly realized his mistake. He was not teaching Hermione and Neville a lesson. What he was facing now was his dean. Going back to Solim's question just now, apart from face to face, how many ways of communication are there between wizards? The most common way is to send letters through owls. If possible, you can also use the fireplace grab a handful of flow powder, lean half your body over, and you can talk to another person in front of the fireplace. If you are more wealthy, you can using a double-sided mirror. In the eyes of ordinary wizards, the double-sided mirror is a tall thing, equivalent to the Big Brother in the 1980s and 1990s. Members of the Order of the Phoenix can also communicate with the headmaster himself through small notes made by Dumbledore. Of course, the Death Eaters had a similar method, and that was the dark mark branded by Voldemort himself. However, except owls that rely purely on physical strength to communicate across space, the rest of these methods rely on magic to eliminate the influence of space. Flow powder itself contains magic power. When the magic power is exhausted, you can either eat a mouthful of furnace ashes, or grab a handful of flow powder and throw it in when the magic power is almost exhausted. Double-sided mirror, this relies on the magic power of the wizard himself. One wizard outputs magic power to the double-sided mirror, 
and the other matching double-sided mirror will respond, so the two wizards in different places can communicate. When one party stops the magic power output, the connection built by the double-sided mirror will be interrupted. The communication between Dumbledore's note and Voldemort's dark mark also uses magic to overcome spatial obstacles. Break the barrier of space, let two people communicate as if they were face to face. Whether it's a fireplace, a double-sided mirror, or something else, wizards do this by expending magic. Muggles are the same, whether it's a phone, a computer or something else, they all use electricity to achieve the same purpose. But this is the communication between living people, or in other words, it is the communication across space by consuming energy in the same dimension. But there are some subtle differences in the communication between the living and the dead. This is different from the communication between the living and the ghosts. Although the ghosts are dead, they are not completely dead. To communicate with a completely dead person, it requires a stronger force to break some kind of shackles. Ordinary magic power is not enough, and the magic power of human wizards is not very strong. Unleashing great power by burning the soul is a proven method. Ordinary magic is compared to this power as a coal-fired power plant is compared to a nuclear power plant. Although there is not much difference in essence, the strength, quality, and duration of the former and the latter are not comparable at all. Snape sort of accepted Solim's explanation. Soul, this subject Snape never had the opportunity to study, and of course he never had the opportunity to study it. You will never find a book on the analysis of the soul in the market, let alone how to use the soul. Snape couldn't help being a little jealous of his student, family background, wealth, talent, these things that he once dreamed of, his student in front of him possessed them all, and he didn't waste these advantages, and he knew how to use them. Professor, let me put it up front. It is true that you can communicate with a dead person after paying a certain price, but the premise is that the dead person has not gone to the place of death. Give Snape a vaccination first, it doesn't matter as for the biggest obsession in Snape's life, if something went wrong, Snape might find himself in trouble. Frowning slightly, Snape looked at Solemn. Explain, that's not what you said at the beginning. I didn't tell you before because I don't know how to explain these things to you. Spreading his hands, Solemn said helplessly. Before. Now. Now, I'm too lazy to explain. You should read it yourself, if you understand it. Solemn took out another book from under his robe and threw it directly on the table. This is something from nearly 15 centuries ago. This is a handwritten book, which was originally estimated to have disappeared. Snape glanced at the cover and knew what was going on. Old English refers to English from 449 AD to 1100 AD. There are great differences between Old English and Modern English in pronunciation, spelling, vocabulary, and morphology. It is impossible to understand without special study. Moreover, there were still four main dialects in the Old English period, which led to different spellings of the same words between various dialects, and few wizards today can understand them. As for Solemn, ha, thank goodness he speaks English without an accent now. You must know that when he was just learning to speak when he was a child, his natural accent scared his family members into thinking there was something wrong with his tongue. Watching Snape turn the pages of the book, he closed the book again. Solemn knew that Snape couldn't read it either, and wizards now of course spoke modern English, so it wasn't surprising that they couldn't read it. Relax, professor, I'm talking about the worst case scenario. Solemn tucked the book back into his robes. That ancient spell on Potter is still in effect, so be reassured. It was almost dinner time when Solemn walked out of Filch's office. He came straight to Filch after lunch, and spent the afternoon in his small room full of seafood. For nothing else, the first one is of course Filch's current physical condition, and the second one is naturally the legendary, Marauder's Map. First of all, Filch's current state is surprisingly good, especially in terms of spirit. Now he doesn't even care about those Gryffindor students who like to make trouble. He has been a squib for half his life, and seeing that he is about to become a real wizard, Filch naturally has more important things to do, who would go what about those mischievous students? According to Filch, he can't wait to get a wand of his own now, but that won't be until at least the next semester, because Filch has a rare luxury for himself he found a wandmaker customized your own wand. Just last Hogsmeade day, after dismissing the older students, Filch had made a trip to Hogsmeade, where he had struck a deal with a wandmaker. 
Ordinary wands nowadays can't adapt to Filch's magical power. According to Snape, Filch's current magical power is stronger than that of many Aurors. Solemn was actually a little uneasy, he wasn't sure what impact this incident would have and what consequences it would cause. Filch wasted most of his life at Hogwarts as a squib, watching those little wizards waste their talents and time, while he was just a squib who wanted to become a wizard so much. How does this distorted emotion affect a person? And it's not that some people don't do evil, but they don't have the power to do evil. Solemn didn't know what was going to happen to Filch, but at least for now everything looked fine. And no matter how this matter develops in the end, the headmaster, Dumbledore, definitely can't ignore it. Who calls him a headmaster? Besides, the potion was researched, improved, and brewed by Snape, how much money does it have to do with his Solemn? Put all this mess aside. For today's harvest, Solemn is still very satisfied. He got the Marauder's map, and it will be much easier to move around the school in the future. When Solemn walked into the auditorium, quite a few people were already eating, and he saw that Gryffindor was sitting alone with Neville, Harry, Ronald and Hermione were not there. It is estimated that they are either at Hagrid's place or in the reading library. When they can't find information about Nicholas May, they will definitely come to him, so Solemn is lazy to take care of these Gryffindors. How's the finish of the afternoon? Solemn asked, sitting next to Draco, forking a pork chop. I think I have found the feeling you mentioned, that kind of. Draco thought for a while, but couldn't find the right words to describe it. Quote dot dot dot. The feeling of being able to release a spell with a single thought. That's right, that's right. Draco nodded in agreement hastily. That's really congratulations. Solemn raised his eyebrows and looked at Draco in surprise, silent casting is very close to you. Of course, I'm only referring to the disarming spell. Solim's surprise was not feigned, Draco hadn't practiced the disarming spell for long, and now he had touched the threshold of silent casting of this spell, which was really good. That's not bad, I must master the silent casting of the disarming curse before I go home, and my father will be surprised when I go home. Draco said excitedly, what reward do you think he will give me? That's your dad, not my dad, how do I know what reward he will give you? Rolling his eyes, Solemn continued to cut the pork chops on the plate. In fact, when he first came to school, Solemn didn't touch pork chops and steaks. He was really afraid that a knife would make his face bloody. However, after observing that these steaks seemed to be fully cooked, he started to eat them with confidence. By the way, Solemn, the registration will be tomorrow. Draco motioned Solemn to look at the door. Do you think that scarred face will stay in school? Glancing at the trio who were walking towards the long table of Gryffindor, Solemn said indifferently, you don't care if they go back, but take care of yourself. Draco has no major problems, but he likes to show off, and people who look down on him like to retaliate. I said, are you in a hurry? Do you have any serious conflicts with him? You might as well practice your spells if you have time to find fault. Solemn wondered whether to let them fight and vent. After eating, Solemn and Draco walked towards the small classroom, Draco wanted Solemn to give guidance, and Solemn waited for Hermione to return the book. The two had been in the small classroom for less than five minutes when someone else entered, four of Gryffindor's men. Draco looked at Harry and Ronald in disgust, but said nothing. Several people came in and looked at each other, and finally Hermione spoke. Solemn, I want to ask, do you know Nico? Nicole. Solemn didn't know why, but suddenly wanted to continue. And his hands showed signs of being out of control. Huh. Several people asked questions, not knowing what Solemn was talking about. Hee hee, don't worry, you guys want to ask Nicholas. The three nodded quickly. I do know Nicole May, he is a very famous wizard, even muggles know his name. But we searched the library all afternoon and couldn't find any information about him. Hermione was a little hysterical and it was the first time she left the library empty-handed. I think the books you were looking for are all modern books, so of course you won't get any information about Nicholas. Solemn said that you are all in the wrong direction, and it is a ghost if you can find it. Nicole May, what is the first thing people think of when you mention this name? Draco. Solemn motioned to Draco. The Sorcerer's Stone. Draco sneered at the Gryffindor group. What? Based on the idea that you guys also want to play the Philosopher's Stone. Okay, 
Okay, Solemn said quickly, before they would have to fight again. The Philosopher's Stone, this is a top alchemical product. With it, you have gold and immortality. Nicholas Flamel and his wife are over 600 years old. It is the Philosopher's Stone. Quote. Hearing the incredible function of the Sorcerer's Stone, several people were a little dazed for a while. Yeah, Philosopher's Stone, who wouldn't want it? Solemn frowned at Ronald. This is what the brat muttered. Snake tried to steal it. Remember. He hurt his leg on Halloween, it must have been bitten by Fluffy, and Snake was trying to get through that trapdoor. Harry suddenly figured it all out, or thought he figured it out up. It's Professor Snape, and you should have the least respect for a professor. Solemn looked at Harry. But Harry ignored it, we should tell Dumbledore about this. Wait, Harry. We can't be so hasty now. Papa, Solemn clapped his hands, attracting the attention of several people. I probably get it. You think Professor Snape is trying to steal the Philosopher's Stone, don't you? I have to say, when will you Gryffindors be able to use their brains? In fact, at the beginning, Solemn was also hesitant about what kind of role he should play in these so-called storylines, whether to actively participate or passively accept. But then Solemn also figured it out, he didn't live for Harry Potter, nor did he have to kill Voldemort. So is he a bystander. The setting of the bystander is unacceptable to Solemn. He thinks that since he has come, it is unreasonable not to leave something behind. In the end, Solemn decided to do whatever he wanted, as long as he didn't kill himself. Do you know how big the Philosopher's Stone is? It's not bigger than your fist. Solemn compared his fist. Such an important thing, if you were you, would you feel free to leave it anywhere? Wouldn't it be safer for Dumbledore to carry such a big thing with him? Why not hide it in a corner of the school? The few people Solemn said were speechless. Dumbledore was always with him, it was a safe way to go. But in this way, the old Mr. Volt who was still running around the corpse would have nothing to play, and this was not Dumbledore's intention. Use the Philosopher's Stone, a bait that Voldemort cannot refuse, to lure him out, to observe his current state, to judge how long it will take for him to return to the wizarding world, and to exercise Potter by the way, this should be Dumbledore's idea. It's not safe to put it on your body. If it is dropped or stolen, it's not impossible. Ronald looked at Solemn suspiciously. He believed that all Slytherins could not be trusted. Do you think Dumbledore is you? Or do you think carrying means carrying the Philosopher's Stone in your pocket? Solemn looked at Ronald in disbelief. Simply, it's okay to say some stupid things when you're younger. It's fine if a little muggle-born wizard says that. But the Weasley family is a wizarding family anyway. No matter how the children are kept, the wizards use the traceless stretching spell to put bags and boxes to hold things. This kind of thing should be known. Isn't there a container in the Weasley family that can store items? The one that uses the untraceable stretching charm. Even if there isn't one, you should have heard of it, right? HMPH. Their poor house only has walls and floors, how would they know this? Draco took the opportunity to sarcastically sarcastically at Ronald. Ronald's face was almost the same color as his hair now. It used to be, every time Draco taunted Ronald with, poor, he did. No way, this is a weak point attack for Ronald. Do you understand now? Even if the headmaster didn't carry it with him, but actually put it in the school, it has nothing to do with you. Whether it's Professor Snape, or Quirrell, or even Professor McGonagall, whoever it is, whoever it is who's up for the Sorcerer's Stone, and whoever is trying to steal it has nothing to do with you first years. Get it. Solemn sneered at Harry, mainly this bear who likes to play around sun, don't you know how much you weigh? But someone is going to steal the Philosopher's Stone. We can't just leave it alone. Harry said, sticking his neck. Clam. This is the first time for Solemn to seriously look at the, savior, in front of him. Still unable to hold back, Solemn chuckled. Okay, so what are you going to do? Um, tell the professor. Solemn folded his arms and looked at Harry. I can tell you very clearly, Harry, when you say the word philosopher's stone to any professor sometimes, they will startle them first, except of course our dean, he will deduct your points, maybe even put you in confinement. And I think you will not go to Professor Snape no matter how stupid you are, you are most likely the best thing is to go to Professor McGonagall. 
When you say the word philosopher's stone to Professor McGonagall, if she has a book in her hand, she will definitely drop it on the ground. Then she will ask you how you know about the philosopher's stone, and will tell you that the sorcerer's stone is safe, so you don't need to worry about it anymore. Solim's description is accurate, and Professor McGonagall's reaction is like this. After all, he is someone who has seen the movie five times. Harry and the others thought about it carefully. If they went to find Professor McGonagall, it seemed to be such a process and result. Understood. The professors will ignore you. So what are you going to do? Protect the philosopher's stone by yourself. Solemn smiled sinisterly, you are asking for your own death. The sorcerer's stone, all wizards who know this thing are rarely indifferent. Gold is secondary, mainly because the so-called immortality effect of the philosopher's stone is really eye-catching. Immortality, how many people can resist the temptation of immortality? The most important thing is that there are still two people Nicole May and his wife Paranel, these two people have lived to more than 600 years old. Little wizards like Harry, they don't think about what kind of existence a wizard who dares to use the philosopher's stone would be like. Not to mention the people in Hogwarts and under the eyes of Dumbledore who dare to do things and steal the sorcerer's stone under such conditions, are they able to deal with them? They don't think about the danger at all, or that said, they don't realize the danger at all. So, under such circumstances, you are going to protect the Philosopher's Stone from one or a few extremely dangerous wizards. Can I understand this? Solemn leaned back on the chair, crossed his legs, swayed, he didn't think the Philosopher's Stone would be stolen at all. Don't you know how many caddies and tails you have? If you want to die, go alone, and don't have to drag the people around you into the water. Solim's words left Harry and Ronald completely dumbfounded. Solem has already told them clearly that they have been busy thinking that they are the last line of defense to protect the sorcerer's stone, but in fact they are not as effective as closing Luwe's wooden gate. This is how the two of them accepted it. Now that you all know that there is a council of elders, do you think the council of elders can ignore things like the philosopher's stone? Solem asked a good question. I can't say how familiar I am with the Philosopher's Stone, but I know far better than you. My great-great-grandfather's father is still alive and well, contributing to the construction of the European wizarding world. Solem was shocked when he found out that his heavenly grandfather was still alive. What is heavenly grandfather? That was grandpa's grandpa's father. That's two generations older than Dumbledore. Besides, since the Sorcerer's Stone came out, how many people have thought about it, have you thought about it? Has anyone succeeded? Grindelwald, Voldemort, when they were the most powerful, they didn't have the idea of playing with the Philosopher's Stone. Why? Think about it carefully, and there are some, obscure things involved. But now, one, or a few wizards, came to Hogwarts to do something under Dumbledore's nose. Do you really think that such a thing can be participated in by you little wizards who can't even use the disarming spell? Solemn said with a smile, he couldn't help it. This feeling of beating others is indeed very attractive to Solemn, and sometimes Solemn himself is not sure whether the people staying in Skull are a bit perverted. Okay, okay, if you want to play the game of protecting the treasure, go ahead and play it, don't worry, someone will take care of it for you, Solemn waved his hand, as long as you don't really fool around with the idea of playing the Philosopher's Stone. Quote. The Philosopher's Stone thing, Solemn admits that he has a little bit of a thing for immortality. But when he really learned something about the Sorcerer's Stone, he honestly strangled this little thought to death. Just like what Solemn said to the Treasure Guard team just now. How could the Council of Elders who control the entire continent of Europa not pay attention to the Sorcerer's Stone? Indeed, the, people, who came up with the Philosopher's Stone idea didn't succeed. But the Presbyterians are not, people. The Presbyterian Church is a huge organization with influence all over the world, and the one with the strongest control is Europe. After all, the Presbyterian Church originated in Europe. When the Philosopher's Stone came out, when it was reported that this little red stone could make people live forever, I don't know how many wizards or other things tried to get Nicole May's idea, trying to blackmail him and make him hand over the magic stone. It's just ridiculous. Few people can find him. Even if you find his address, even if you try your best to get into the door of LeMay's house, you can only lie down honestly in the end, in the home of a master alchemist against an alchemist, it's the same as committing suicide. 
In the end, Nicholas May handed over the philosopher's stone. You say that he is under pressure or cooperates with each other. Anyway, Nicole May, an old man, joined the Presbyterian Church, and he has an extremely special status. You know, many people in the Presbyterian Church can live until now because of the blessing of the Philosopher's Stone. With the backing of the Council of Elders, who could have the idea of the Philosopher's Stone? Let's not talk about the protection Nicole himself gave himself. Ever since he joined the Council of Elders, the Council of Elders has attached great importance to his personal safety. There is even a team of elite wizards stationed in Nicole May's place of residence all year round. Of course, it is hard to say whether it is protection or surveillance. And the birth of each philosopher's stone will be recorded by the Council of Elders, who will be assigned to use this philosopher's stone, and which team will be responsible for escorting it. Just like the armored vehicles, there are strict procedures every time. As for the reason Solemn dissuaded him, it was the process of preparing the philosopher's stone. Alchemy, to put it bluntly, is transformation. Transformation of one substance into another. When a person lives until he dies, he is consuming one thing, life force. The philosopher's stone keeps people alive by replenishing the user's vitality. The problem is that there is currently no way to convert something like vitality. It's like transfiguration, you can turn a chair into a cake, but you won't be full after eating it, and you won't get nutrition. This is the GAMP rule. And when the magic power applied to the chair is exhausted, the cake will turn back into the chair and burst your stomach. Since vitality cannot be transformed through other substances. But how does the philosopher's stone replenish life force? There is only one answer, to take the life force of other lives and transform it into a life force that can be absorbed through the magic stone. This is the truth about the sorcerer's stone. So what about vitality? From whom? Who? These problems are the problems of Mr. Nakoda, we just need to know the result. The old man has done an unknown number of experiments, and he does not know how many lives Huohuo died. Finally, the answer emerged, human beings, or human-like life, have the best effect. Nicole May was originally only a handicraft workshop, and later joined the Presbyterian Church, which is equivalent to being acquired. You come to provide technical support, and our elders will provide production materials. Forcibly turning a manual workshop into an assembly line. Of course, it is an exaggeration to say that the assembly line is an exaggeration, but the efficiency and yield rate are much higher than Nicholas May's previous one. But here comes the problem. Nicole May makes the philosopher's stone by himself, and just goes to the prison to find a few condemned prisoners. But let the elders do this, to put it bluntly, the raw materials are not enough. Without raw materials, there would be no sorcerer's stone, and without the sorcerer's stone, some people would not be able to survive. What to do? How can we get a large amount of human-like vitality? It can be said that whenever the raw materials of the sorcerer's stone are in short supply, wars will break out. Then the raw materials are enough, and the war is over. Solemn does not think he is a good person, he also admits that in order to survive, life will always kill another life, like the dead bodies of all kinds of life being served on the table, these, solemn he accepts, and for tasting these the living corpse is still enjoying it. However, just wanting to live on, and using the sorcerer's stone to achieve the goal in order to live on, this is something solemn can't accept. Solemn has always believed that a person can be evil and do all kinds of evil, but he cannot live without a bottom line. To say a bad street saying, if a person has no bottom line, he cannot be called a human being. But the fact now is, some wizards choose to, eat, people, in order to survive. A hard-working office worker is exploited by the vicious capitalists every day. Indeed, this can also be said to be a kind of, cannibalism, but it is not as naked as the philosopher's stone. When Solemn knew these things about the sorcerer's stone, he decided, even if he was dying of old age and was pressed on his neck by the scythe of death, he would never use the sorcerer's stone. Okay, you can do whatever you want. Solemn waved his hand, ready to send everyone away, but I still want to remind you once again, you can play your treasure hunting game, but don't play it. The idea of the philosopher's stone. Although it is impossible to succeed, I still remind you. Although Solemn himself has not seen the Sorcerer's Stone with his own eyes, he can guess that the Sorcerer's Stone that Nicholas Flamel gave Dumbledore is probably not the full version, and it can be used once or twice. 
Although Nicole May's status is special, the Council of Elders controls the Philosopher's Stone very strictly. Nicole may have given Dumbledore a, castrated version, of the Philosopher's Stone, which already reflects Nicole's status. Watching Potter and Weasley's group walk out the door of the small classroom, Draco took Neville to the next door to practice the disarming charm. Solemn looked around for no one, and pulled out the Marauder's map he'd gotten from Filch. I solemnly swear that I have no good intentions. Pointing his wand at the map, Solemn spoke the password. Looking at a personal name that appeared on the originally blank parchment, lines appeared one by one. Solemn knew that many places at Hogwarts had opened up to him. Solemn saw the names of Harry Potter, who were moving in the corridor, and also saw the names of Draco and Neville marked on the map outside the wall. Similarly, the self next door to them will of course appear on the map. But when Solemn saw himself on the map, all the muscles in his body tensed up. What's going on? Solemn screamed frantically inside. On the place where Solemn was supposed to be on the map, a strange thing appeared. An ink blob was shaking irregularly, as if trying to form some letters, but every time it was about to become a letter, it scattered again. Solemn's nose flared and his brow furrowed. He doesn't understand what's going on. The maps are good, that's for sure. After all, other people's names are fine, and the problem lies with oneself. Did someone put a curse on his name? Solemn began to wonder if someone put a distraction spell or shielding spell on his name to prevent others from tracking him. But on second thought, is this necessary? He is just an illegitimate child, of little value, even if it is because he killed that annoying ghost, his family will not choose to do it in Hogwarts if they want to clean up him. Solemn decided to read some books about the magic of names during his vacation. He had to figure out what was wrong with his name. Truth be told, Solemn never had Christmas. And he was also wondering why wizards had to celebrate ordinary people's festivals. What's even more peculiar is that even Skylar will take 15 days off for this. You know, originally Solemn had no concept of these western festivals, but since he went to school in Skylar, he immediately had a clear and profound concept of Christmas. A full 15-day holiday without soul robbing no Crucidus curse, no sneak attacks from other people, no need to sleep with a wand at night. These 15 days can be said to be the most relaxing period of the year for Solemn. Yes, for Solemn, Christmas is a day of comfort without the imperious and Crucidus curse. And for the famous savior, this Christmas may be his best Christmas ever. After all, referring to Harry's experience in the past few years, every Christmas is a kind of torture for him. As long as he didn't stay with the Dursleys, Harry didn't care how he spent the holiday, so he happily signed the detention list. But he's not alone, his best friend, Ronald and his two, um, three older brothers will stay and spend Christmas at Hogwarts. It's not about looking after Harry of course, it's just that their parents are going to Romania this Christmas to visit their son and older brother, Charlie Weasley. While Harry and Ronald were wandering the empty school, Solemn was back at Selwyn Castle, he wouldn't call it home. Selwyn's castle is located near the Isle of Man, and is hidden by magic. Passing ships will actively avoid it, so as to avoid being discovered by ordinary people. The island called Nestor by the wizards cannot be found on the maps of ordinary people. In Greek, Nestor means unknown. After all, this island is only open to people from the Selwyn family, and very few people who are qualified to come here. So for most wizards, everything here is unknown. Solemn is not very familiar with this place, because he spends most of his time in the castle learning theoretical knowledge and practicing spell casting. Even if it wasn't familiar, Solemn knew that approaching the castle casually could cause trouble. Compared with Hogwarts, Selwyn's castle is indeed not majestic enough. It doesn't have tall towers like Hogwarts, nor is it full of life like Hogwarts. If you let an ordinary person who doesn't understand magic look at it, Selwyn's castle is definitely a standard template for the headquarters of evil creatures in fairy tales. Even on a sunny day, the light will not shine on the castle even though the country of Ying it's rare in hell that it doesn't rain, but there are always sunny days. The whole castle seems to be in another world, the sun will hide from the castle, the light will not shine on it, and compared with the bright colors around the castle, the castle itself is like a black and white photo dead and lifeless. And this is the place where Solemn lived, a castle that one would instinctively want to stay away from from a distance.
and he will continue to live here until Solom is able to protect himself. Solom stands in front of the statue at the intersection. This statue is the first patriarch of the Selwyn family. The base of the statue is densely engraved with his life story, and such statues line both sides of the road leading to the castle. They are all well-known wizards from the Selwyn family, whether they are villains full of crimes, great men who have made outstanding contributions to the wizarding world, or strange people who are dedicated to studying and studying magic. Regardless of good or evil, as long as it is Selwyn who is well-known in the wizarding world, their statues will be placed on both sides of the road. Selwyn has been passed down for a long time, which leads to one thing, there are more and more statues, and the road to the castle is getting longer and longer. This road full of statues is enchanted, it will not become crowded because of the increase of statues, it will only get longer and longer. It would take 30 minutes to walk to the gates of the castle if it was long enough to walk on two legs. Sitting in the carriage, Solemn looked at the statue outside the window, but what he thought about was how to sneak into the basement unknowingly after returning to the castle. Not only did his chief father's family live in this castle, but several of his uncle's families also lived in this castle with them, adding up to nearly 30 people. If counting the wizards with foreign surnames who passed the family test and joined, there could be more than 50 people. Barring those alien wizards, Selwyn could count on one hand who could give Solemn good looks. Solemn is unwilling to come back here. The environment and history here have created the dark wizard in the eyes of most ordinary wizards. And these people are almost all his relatives, and most of them are from Sigil. So the way they greet each other is kind of scary, give you a Crucitus curse or Imperious curse when you're not looking, they call it a joke. Indeed, it is no big deal for a wizard who can graduate from Skylar to suffer from the Crucitus curse. Everyone has long been used to the Crucitus curse. As for the Imperious Curse, huh, it is simply wishful thinking to use the Imperious Curse to easily control a wizard who graduated from Skull. They'll break free of the Imperious Curse so quickly, they won't even respond to your Imperious Curse at all, and then turn around and give you an Avada. After all, more than 10 years of experience in Skylar has given these wizards amazing resistance and immunity to the Crucitus Curse and Imperious Curse. Most of these relatives of Solom are a little bit out of order, that's normal. Whether it is the atmosphere of the Selwyn family or the environment of Skylar, if it can create a normal wizard, it is called abnormal. And these, abnormal relatives are not exactly friendly to Solom. The grown-ups disdain to speak to Solom, and if they do speak, it is some extremely ugly and strongly insulting language, and if Solim's grandfather is present, they will restrain themselves. But the peers who are about the same age as Solom are not so restrained. It is common for them to pull out their wands and attack Solom in the castle. They take pleasure in bullying and making fun of Solom, and they never get tired of it. Of course, they held back a bit after Solom took out a nuisance at school in a black glove duel. But it was just not hitting him with the wand anymore. Oh, Solom, are you back? At the sound, Solim's body relaxed, he was about to draw his wand. Cheetos. Oh, yes, I'm back. Reluctantly. Solemn shrugged. A white, somewhat transparent figure emerged from the side wall, it was a ghost. Compared to people, Solemn gets along well with the ghosts in the castle. Of course, there are also a few ghosts who are very disgusted with the identity of Solim's illegitimate child. These ghosts in the castle were all surnamed Selwyn during their lifetime. In other words, these ghosts in the castle were the ancestors of the Selwyn family. Be careful, Adelaide and his brothers are very excited to hear that you are coming back today. Let's go from the number 3 laboratory. There was no one there when I just came here. After finishing speaking, Cheetos just floated ahead of Solemn and led the way. How's life at Hogwarts? Cheetos asked. Not bad, no, it's good. Even when he was walking, Solim's left hand was always ready. Yeah, no matter where it is, it's better than that shitty place. Cheetos can be regarded as the most compatible ghost with Solemn, which probably has something to do with his experience. Cheetos also, used, to be a student of Sculler before his death. Saying, used to be, is not because he is dead now, but because Cheetos was expelled from school that year, which resulted in him not graduating from Skylar. As for the reason for the expulsion, Cheetos didn't say anything, and Solemn didn't bother to ask. Elrond is in his kennel, 
Go yourself, I won't go, said Kiddo, and disappeared through the wall. Elrond is Solim's grandfather. Among all Solim's relatives, only his grandfather and his sister Serna are sincerely good to Solim. But Solim's grandfather, Elrond, has an embarrassing position in the family. Elrond's two brothers, Lesotho and Breed, both of them are great wizards, great wizards like Dumbledore and Voldemort. Lesotho is the leader of the Dangerous Placement Committee directly under the Presbyterian Church, while Breed is the head of the Logistics Department of the Dangerous Placement Committee. Many elders in Solemn work under these two men. Look at Elrond again, he is not a great wizard, although he is much stronger than ordinary wizards, but in the eyes of a family like Selwyn, so much time and resources have been wasted, and he is not considered a great wizard at this age. Wizard, this talent is simply an embarrassment to Selwyn. Elrond's father and grandfather sometimes returned to Selwyn Castle, Solim's great-grandfather and great-grandfather. As for why these two people can live for so long, is there any need to ask? And these two old antiques are dark wizards in various senses. Although he can't do anything with his family, he will still sneer when he sees the offspring of waste materials. In this way, other younger generations of the family also disrespected Elrond. Although they would not do anything outrageous in person, they chewed their tongues behind their backs. Think about Solim's squib sister again. They have three grandparents, the old one is a waste material, and the two young ones, one is an illegitimate child and the other is a squib. It is not bad that such three people can live like this in a family like Selwyn. Solim's feeling for the other Selwyns was just, no feeling. He only cared about his grandfather and younger sister. As for the other clansmen, they were no different from strangers. Elrond is not good at potions, and he is not good at fighting. Alchemy is so-so. Of course, this so-so can be called a master in the outside world. Elrond's real forte is to solve curses. There is only one spellbreaker mentioned in the original book, and that is Bill Weasley, the eldest brother of the Weasley family. In the circle of the Selwyn family, the status of the curse breaker is very low. Although every wizard inevitably has to deal with the curse breaker, the curse breaker is looked down upon by these wizards. In Solim's view, this is like the ancient Chinese attitude towards doctors, indispensable, but low status. The role of spell breakers is to crack spells. Their understanding and research on magic lines, spell theory, spells and compound spells far exceeds that of ordinary wizards. They are good at breaking spells, inventing and improving spells. It can be said that the spells used by wizards today are all thanks to the spell breakers. It was Elrond who taught Solemn the, fierce flame, spell that Solemn used against the troll. Solemn called a house elf to lead the way. It's not that he doesn't know the way, but that there are some magic organs on the road in the basement that need to be temporarily closed. Solemn can't do these tasks now, so the elf can only do it for him. Okay, you can go back, Zim. Solemn put down the box in his hand and was about to knock on the door. By the way, call Serna over for me, and don't let others find out. As soon as the elf disappeared, the door opened in front of Solemn. Come in, I count the time and you should be here almost. Standing inside the door was an old man in fairly good spirits, with the same black hair as Solemn, but the hairstyle was of the same size, not as long as Solim's hair. As for Solim's hair. For him, he never had the opportunity to grow long hair in his previous life, whether it was at school or at work, but now Solim's hair is just touching his shoulders. Long hair was a novel experience for Solim. Come in quickly, and tell me about your experience at Hogwarts. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support our channel.